you've heard a lot today, right? I mean, I heard some of it, not all, but you've heard about the future of Border Patrol. You've heard about various challenges, including fentanyl. Uh, discuss AI and data analytics for mission support. And now in this last session, this last session, what we want to do is put this together. I want to discuss how AI is currently being leveraged, how it may be used to meet future needs, what are the challenges, and how industry can help. So there's a lot to talk about, so let's get started. So I'd like to start with, um, you've already heard the introductions, I'd like to start with um, Wole and Jay, both of you. So let's, Wole, let's start with you. So based on your knowledge of what you see as kind of the best either current or future technologies, what do you think are some of the, the best use cases? What, how do you think AI can best be leveraged by Border Patrol? Okay, I'll start. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right, awesome. So I'm Wale Moses, as, as mentioned earlier. I'm part of the Microsoft Federal Civilian Team, and I'm helping to lead a lot of our generative AI initiatives. And as a result, this has been, I've been at Microsoft almost 25 years. This is the busiest year ever with all of the excitement over generative AI. So, so Dr. Brothers, to your question, uh, obviously generative AI is the exciting, uh, is the topic du jour. And there's a lot of interesting questions from a use case perspective. Generative AI really um, can help around doing things like uh, analysis of data, uh, creation of data, and searching across data. You can apply that across uh, tactical implementations. There's some, uh, if you think about, for example, around uh, analysis of data, thinking about um, a corpus of data that might be might include witness statements. It might include social me what's happening in social media. Uh, it might include uh, other uh, details from other cases, similar cases that might be currently being investigated. Generative AI lets us do that analysis at scale. And so, and it lets us, to, lets us automate that. And so that's just one quick example. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there'll be others and I'm sure we'll get into that. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Jay. Yeah, so um, when you're talking about AI, we've had, this is not the first time you heard about it today, right? And we've heard, talked about a lot of folks have talked about what is required. So the enablement of AI has a lot of precursors, right? The precursors would be infrastructure, endpoint computing, edge computing, tactical computing, um, the communications infrastructure, the sensors doing their job. But when we start talking about AI, whether it's generative AI, predictive models that are beyond standard generative AI, the challenge is, is this is not Microsoft Office. You don't stick a CD-ROM in and all of a sudden this thing boots up and boom, you have AI, right? The selection of your language model, uh, whether it's something you develop yourself or something that's open source that you tailor to, is something that has to be trained, right? You have to train that AI to do and do the work for you to help augment what it is, the repetitive tasks or the tactical tasks that are necessary. Training that AI after you've selected a model or two, and sometimes you need more than one to do a predictive analysis as opposed to a generative analysis, uh, requires you to invest that time and energy and also ensure that that AI gives you what you're looking for and is within bounds of what you're trying to achieve. Thanks. You know, Jim, I'm not going to let you off the hook yet. So framework, how would you think about, so given what you just said, do you have a framework for thinking about what kinds of use cases are applicable that to most effectively and efficiently use in AI? Yeah, so, um, so my colleague from Microsoft made it very clear that there are some scenarios about ingesting the information and getting access to that information quickly. And that is a use case that is developed um, and quite frankly, very successful. But imagine that you have the warfighter in the field, the tactical agent in the field, all they've got is their SME pad or their phone or assuming they can have some connectivity to, to whatever they're looking at. But if I'm driving around in my Jeep and I'm trying to decide I'm going to have to approach an adversary, and this was mentioned a little bit earlier today, if, if the sensors are telling me that it's eight people and it looks like a family with a bunch of small children, my threat level is going to be different. If that predictive model tells me they've started here, they're gonna go this way, which is a known bad way, and it looks like they're carrying rifles that are slung over their shoulder, my response is gonna be different. If we go back to what the chief said this morning, everything that we're trying to do revolves around, can they get their job done the most effective way to defend the nation? And two, do they go home to their families at night? And if you think about some of the models that my colleague talked about and some of the models that, are, that get intermixed with that, if making that work so that the decision that need to be made by the operator is solely based, is based on information available so that I can decide What's my threat level? Do I need that help? Because seconds matter, we heard that. If, if 
if help is 20 minutes away, I might want to not engage and go get that help before I engage anything to defend that border. Now, you can take that same use case for predictive for fiscal, workforce labor, supply chain. It all rolls into the same thing. But training that model to make it work that way is a function of not exorbitant amount of time, but you've got to think through the use cases end to end and make sure that that model gets trained effectively. Otherwise, the model is just something else consuming CPU cycles and calm bandwidth. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, John, over to you. So, so from your perspective, what are some of the use cases that you're currently using um, AI to try to, to try to get some better capability out of? Sure, Reggie, and I'm going to be very concise because I realize that the only thing between you and happy hour is us. <laughs> so I want to make sure that I, I use my time wisely. So a few things, just to, to touch on what Jay and Wole said. CVP faces uh, just a huge scale, uh, un almost an unimaginable scale of number of travelers, migrants encountered between the ports of entry, cargo containers that we encounter at our ports. And that, that grows every year. So uh, I would love to say that our, our workforce also grows at the same proportion, but it's just not the reality. So how do, we, how do we deal with those challenges? One is we need to find ways, and we are looking at ways to reduce the cognitive loads uh, on, our, on our officers and agents, and that's something that's already been touched on. So for example, uh, applying computer vision technology uh, at, at our ports of, uh, or actually between the ports of entry. So instead of having agents uh, glued to screens uh, looking at video, you know, applying computer vision that, that actually can detect whether or not that uh, the thing that's crossing is it, is it uh, a human or is it caribou? Uh, it's most important for us to know the, the distinction uh, and then take action based on that. Um, also looking at, uh, again, looking at that cognitive load piece, you know, um, we have officers that are uh, traditionally have been glued to screens looking at x-rays of conveyances uh, and, and of, of uh, cargo containers. So uh, for instance, a April of this year, we released a solicitation to industry where we're looking to implement um, advanced analytics uh, to, that, uh, to those x-rays. So again, freeing up the officer, instead of looking at a screen for eight hours, being able to use the, the machine learning to be able to, to actually detect an anomaly and then cue the officer to, uh, to do a further inspection. So I would say cognitive load uh, is certainly one of, the, one of the highlights that we're looking at. Thanks, John. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. Sure. Was there, was there another one you wanted to get at? No, that's it, because okay. happy hours. Happy, yeah. okay. yeah. <laughs> My bad, John. Sure. Um, <laughs> Amy, um, yeah. S&T. So what is S&T doing? Give us a baseline. What kind of things is S&T doing in this area? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, so let's see. You know, the decisioning part of AI is always hard, right? Because it's kind of like asking, can you use math to make something better? And the answer is almost always yes, right? <laughs> you can. Uh, and in an s &T, we have to do that not just for CBP, but across all the components. So uh, it's a very broad spectrum, right? And, and when you look at that stuff, and hopefully, you know, someday, you know, we have a new AI task force been there like about six months, so we're just kind of getting off the ground with that. But, uh, you know, number one, you have to look at the value proposition, right? What's what's the return on the investment? Um, uh, and you have to make sure the data are available, right? Uh, that's super, super important. And then um, you have to make sure you're consistent with strategic guidance, right? And in our case, uh, our secretary, Secretary Mayorkas, has given us very specific guidance on the kinds of priority priorities he's assigning right now to AI, and that includes fentanyl detection, you know, child exploitation, uh, adversarial AI, so certain uh, topics that he's very, very interested in, uh, which is what we're assigning highest priority to in our AI task force. As far as programs that we work for CBP, uh, we have um, some things, uh, one called Kestrel, uh, which is a program that uh, ingests all sorts of sensor data, and I'm not gonna get too far into the methods because I don't wanna uh, reveal the, the um, underlying uh, algorithms, but uh, it allows us to do uh, predictions of um, uh, uh, vehicles and, and entities uh, and make interdictions, let's just put it that way. Sure. And uh, it's been very successful to date, and that's uh, a uh, improving program, right? It's sort of 
prototype-ish, uh, but it's been used in operations and it's showing great promise and we continue, we continue to uh, improve on it and expand on it. Another thing that we're working is uh, uh, the Reaper++. I'm from the DOD, so I like to call the MQ-9 Reaper, uh, but, uh, but here at uh, SMT they call it the big wing. Uh, and uh, we're working towards uh, giving that bigger wings basically to add more fuel and extend its uh, lifespan and capacity uh, during uh, any specific operation. So those are kind of a flavor of the types of things we're doing with CBP. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. So John, going back to you. So you mentioned cognitive load, these kinds of things, right? You also mentioned scale in terms of the scale of data. But when you think about the scale of AI adoption within your organization, what are some of the challenges there and how are you working through those? Yeah, really good question. So a couple of things. As far as the the adoption of the technology, and again, we're looking at you know officers and agents, you know, integrating this into their workflow. Um, we know whenever there's a, a new, either a new tool or a new technology, there's going to be an adjustment period, and that's just the uh, just the way it is. You know, I, I am an officer. I, I I understand the mindset of you know having something now dropped in my lap that I need to use. Um, you know, I, there's a certain amount of skepticism that needs to be overcome uh, in that situation. Um, I think I think that uh, as, as Amy talked about, you know, the structures that are being put in place, you know, the AI task force uh, and others, even at the component level, you know, that we, you know, selecting a, a chief AI officer and uh, and setting up the the AI, uh, you know, center of innovation uh, at the CVP level. I think that certainly is going to assist as we move to push these technologies out to the field. Can you? How are you familiar with the, the CVP AI center of innovation? Could you? Can you talk a little bit about that, Jim? Yeah, well, that was stood up uh, just, uh, gee, not that long ago, I guess within the last few years. I think it was recognized at the time that we, we needed um, a way to consolidate the different, the different energies you know, in one place. Uh, and I think we're seeing this really across the government. I think you know, prior to the executive order that, that uh, the White House issued, it, it was kind of the Wild West, I would say. You know, a lot of different disparate efforts in the AI machine learning realm, uh, and not that that's bad, but just to to concentrate that in one area, and again, bring the expertise and the guidance in one area is going to make it stronger, and that's that was the the impetus for the for the AI coy. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going back to you for a second. Um, this is on on the whole scaling issue. So, from a Microsoft perspective, um, you've been there for 25 years, right? Yeah. Um, how have you seen, as, as AI has been deployed, how have you seen the challenges of scale, the challenges of adoption to your own workforce, but also to the, the agencies you're trying to work with? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, to our internal workforce, I'd say it, it's happening right now. So, we're scaling AI uh, into, into our workforce. Most recently, we announced something called Copilot, Microsoft 365 Copilot, which is essentially generative AI on your Microsoft 365, Office 365 data. And so uh, that's happening. We, we, we approach this in, in waves. Uh, I had a conversation just before I got here today with a, another federal agency that's looking to uh, learn from us around how we did it internally. And so uh, there's different approaches. Uh, we typically have communities of practice. Uh, we, stand up centers of excellence, and then we deploy the technology in waves. And so as far as some of the challenges, uh, John talked about this. I mean, when you put a new tool in front of people, um, they, it takes time to get used, used to the, the tool, and they have to learn how to use a tool. And there may be some innate skepticism. And so I think one of the things that needs to be considered and, and we need to do is just have empathy for the fact that, hey, this is we're asking people to do something new. They're used to doing it in a different way, and so now uh, when we drop this new set of tools, uh, there will be some natural skepticism. There may be some fears and concerns around how this technology might um, automate away uh, what they have been doing for a number of years. And so as you deploy the technology, you just have, you have to be thoughtful around that and, and um, consider that as, as part of uh, the way it, it, it is brought into the organization. And one of the another best practice that we've seen to be successful is to uh, do things like find champions internally within the organization who can, or champion or champions within the organization to bring that technology forward. And then also storytell within the organization. So uh, create uh, great examples, positive examples that reinforce how the technology would be beneficial 
and then market those stories internally. And so that's one of the things that sort of reduces the barrier to entry as you try to scale this technology in the organization. As John mentioned, we have very little time, but I do want you to say a couple of words about what a center of excellence is in this, in this context. Yeah, so a center of excellence is an organization within, an organization within the organization that's focused on uh, deploying the technology. So fundamentally, that's what it is. And so there's different components that might, within AI, uh, and especially generative AI, we, we're thinking about things like ethical, there's, someone needs to think about the ethical deployment of AI, responsible AI. Someone needs to think about cyber security implications. Uh, someone needs to think about integration of this technology into the existing uh, tools that we already use. Someone has to, in that center of excellence also needs to think about uh, where are the opportunities to reinvent in existing processes? Um, because, you know, obviously this isn't, when you deploy new technology like AI, this is an opportunity to do things differently. Cool. So those are some of the things we might do within a center of excellence. I appreciate that. John, going back to you. Um, so, uh, so, about data. So, we all know that AI doesn't work without data, right? Data is fundamental to it. So, I know when I was in, in DHS, it was an issue of trying to um, get folks to collaborate, to share data. Can you give us some sense of how that's working now and what some of the efforts are there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I look at this, one of, one of the benefits of being one of the old guys is um, I know what things used to look like. So, uh, you know, starting with, with U.S. Customs Service back in the day, uh, I, I remember looking at, you know, immigration databases, and I had no idea what I was looking at. And even when I finally got access to these immigration databases, I didn't have the, the domain expertise to be able to, to utilize that. So, so I, think it's, I think it's twofold. Um, we have come a long way. Uh, we certainly have. You know, if you look at our National Targeting Center, for instance, we have the, the entire gamut of DHS there, you know, sharing information as well as non-DHS entities uh, that, are, that are also present. Um, we have come a long way. Uh, and I think um, we are looking for, for AI, though, you know, ultimately to, to help to overcome those seams that are naturally uh, in, in data. And I think I was mentioned in one of the earlier ones that you know, the hope is that as we apply these tools, it doesn't matter what format the data is in, whether it's structured or unstructured, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to utilize it uh, in a more holistic way. And we are moving toward that. Um, it, it, it's impossible, I think, to, to uh, really, it's impossible to overemphasize the, the whole priority of, of trust and relationships, honestly. And I think that really, you can build structure but we also know that these things work on trust. Different offices and agencies need to trust each other, that as they share the data, the data will be used uh, in, the, in the appropriate manner. So the guidance and the oversight is there, and I think when you marry that up with, uh, with, the, with the trust relationships of the individual um, entities, then I think you have a, you have a powerful tool. Nice Jake, yeah. we had a good conversation about this yeah. a few minutes ago. Could you talk to where you see the technology is to enable this kind of sharing? So the, <clears throat> the use of technology to enable this is going to come from multiple facets. And, and the determination of what you use and how you use it, anything from on-premise data center, uh, restrictive and self-contained clouds, hosting things in Microsoft. You have the uh, computing at the edge, and then you have to compute at the tactical edge. Um, and, and to use that technology, you have to make it so that the end consumer, in this case, the end consumer very well could be the agent in the field with uh, a tablet or an iPhone, um, needs to be able to be able to utilize that technology without too much hindrance, so the iPhone experience, as, as my boss used to teach me. But then there's pieces that are in between those that make those work, right? So we've talked before on, on panels before us to talk about what happens when you're disadvantaged or disconnected, right? And, and how much can you have when you're in that backup mode? I think the previous panel to this talked about that. And so knowing well, what is on my tablet versus what maybe is in my car, right? Versus what's at a local substation versus what's at home base and making that work. So communications is obviously there. Compute power obviously has to be there. Um, there's, there's discussions of where we can do that. The scaling of using that technology 
and, and we've all learned that maintaining huge on-premise physical data centers is not the answer, right? Using our Microsoft partner is usually one of the fastest ways to get there and keep you out of trouble, right, uh, and, and going forward. But the, but the technology also has to have some controls that keep things in place. And so Anne talked about this in, in hers, but we have to ensure that as we turn this on and we use the technologies that are, are available to us, we have to keep our eye on what's next in technology, right? So there's things coming out like quantum. That's a big thing for us, right? What you can do with quantum and what you can do with those half states. There's also, you know, what is wearable computing going to look like? And, and you know, with every time the iPhone comes out in another generation, the chip doubles in speed, right? So who knows what you can do with that in the future? But also the technology that makes AI work is it has to work on the data it was given. That is either coming from sensor feeds, from a UAV that's loitering, right, as Ann talked about, or it's a sensor tower that's got radar and cameras in it, or it's got records from a subject in investigation. And so the technologies that feed AI are just as important as the AI itself, because without the underlying stuff with it, AI has nothing to work on. Thanks, Jim. Amy, um, so with, this is a border security kind of conference, right? But data can be used in other kinds of applications as well. s and looks across the enterprise. What are some other applications that you see for this? Yeah, so to um, sort of echo what we've heard so far, you know, data sharing is always hard, right? I've been in the DOD, I've been in the IC, now I'm at DHS. Data sharing is always hard. Uh, but we are getting better at it, right? We, we are. And I think AI will help sort of, you know, be an impetus towards moving that uh, further along more quickly. Uh, we, you know, one of the things we're very interested in exploring is the whole idea of foundation models, right, or transformer architectures. Um, and we see a lot of, I, I like to see your head going north and south things. So and we see a lot of goodness, you know, the government... Uh, uh, you know, TSA, you get five and a half million uh, images a day of luggage scans, right? So, um, you know, we see applications like, uh, you know, image-based uh, foundation models, uh, not just across DHS, but across the government, right? So think of, you know, uh, uh, trucks coming across the border, you know, cargo <coughs> at ports, uh, luggage at TSA, but oh, by the way, then you have all the packages at the post office, Right, so you can really sort of come up with this massive data set uh, to characterize stream of commerce data, uh, and basically come up with a a model that would treat imagery much like ChatGPT treats language, right, uh, and sort of understand all the intricacies uh, uh, of looking for um, um, contraband. Uh, in, a, in a broad way where you have a foundational model that really understands that data uh, and, can, and can separate out the idea of what's the scanning technology, you know, from the imagery and sort of uh, normalize across all that. So those are some of the applications we're very interested in looking at. Yeah, so, so Amy, I had a comment. So this is, uh, you hit on one of the areas for me, which is the, one of the most exciting recent developments in uh, large language models, which is you're touching on multimodal yeah. uh, generative AI, and so that is so we so we have that available. Not to be a not to sound like a commercial, uh, so yeah, that's it's, it's super exciting. So the ability to in the first iteration of large language models, we we use text to communicate it with it. You can now use images and video uh, as a as an input, nice. and then the the large language model can interpret what it's seeing and tell you and tell you what it's seeing in amazing levels of detail. And so some of the use cases that you just called out, I think would be perfect uh, example use cases for multimodal generative AI. Jay, can you add, add your thoughts on multiple types of AI for different applications? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry, could you add your comments on mul multiple types of AIs as you're trying to uh, perform a mission? Yeah, so um, you know, the, it's, it's easy to get uh, an understanding that when you, people talk about language models, it can be applied broadly. And as you train those models, those models start falling into categories. Now, there are some models that are very expansive that could, that could input anything from video interpretation to text to audio. And those models are large. And, um, and, and when you work with those, but sometimes you wind up, wind up, excuse me, sometimes you wind up with more than one model at a time. And sometimes some smaller models working together where you have a predictive model associated with uh, movement in the field working with a different model that's dealing with full motion video and size or, or 
or scanning of a, of a package, and then you have another model that's dealing with case study reports. And call them whatever you like, some of them are predictive. Some of these models are built into the hardware of some of the technologies that we're using. Some of these models are loaded onto high performance computing. Letting these models work together is sometimes part of the answer, but you can't impose that on the user. The user has got to have an interface, and sometimes you have to use middleware on top of that interface. And I think I was talking, we were talking earlier about this where, you know, there's a presentation layer that then leads to what's behind, what's behind the curtain. Because quite frankly, most of the users don't need to see all of that. They're not all data scientists. That's, that's an assumption we can't make. So using the multi model approach that deals with multimodal data um, is how it's actually handled when you deal with large data sets of disparate data where they're not characterized. Until, you, until we get to a scenario where data is all properly labeled and encoded, call it zero trust with labels on it, whatever you want to call it, you run to a problem with not only sharing, but different models don't know what they should be touching or how they should present that. And not every user can access every model with the same access level. So we have those problems as well. Good. Thanks, John. Um, John, one, one question here. Um, what, sorry about that. One question here on workforce. So this is relatively new technology. What, what are you concerned about your, work, what, your workforce? So, yeah, I think, you know, as, as we said already, you know, the implementing of something new uh, is, is going to take training, you know, in order to, the tool is really just going to be as good as, as the user, uh, you know, who's, who's actually implementing it. And, and as, as Jay said, you know, the, what's going on in the back end, that has to be, you know, it has to be seamless for the, for the officer or the agent that's actually using this. Um, you know, there is a certain training element. You know, the officer or the agent has to have confidence in the tool that they're using. Um, also, I think internally communicating to the workforce that these tools are not meant to replace them. And I think that was also said earlier today. You know, there is no substitute for, for a human in the loop. That's, uh, you know, that's another theme for the day. But I think that's something that has to be communicated to the workforce that any AI tool or machine learning tool that we, we implement is for the enhancement of the officer or the agent. Uh, it's not to replace them. And I think that's a key point to communicate. And, and back to you, John, is another question for you, John, is on privacy. And, and what, what are your concerns about privacy with this, with this, with this technology? Yeah, so I, I obviously, you know, and I'm looking at this also from the, you know, the, the public perception, you know, that there have been, you know, apocalyptic predictions about, you know, what happens when we implement these tools and, you know, you know, will it, will it be the end of civilization as we know it? I mean, some of the some of the predictions have been, uh, you know, pretty pretty dark. Um, you know, obviously, with, with the whenever you touch data, there are concerns with privacy uh, and and with security. So those are those are real concerns. Um, the guidelines are are in place. You know, with the with the AI task force uh, and really cascading down from the executive order from the White House. You know, as as the department and as uh, the components implement that guidance, you know, it will build on pre-existing privacy guidance that's out there. Um, and you could see that uh, the component, also the department's uh, intent to be as transparent as possible, you know, we, we now have an inventory that's available for, you know, public display uh, on the DHS website that actually lists out all of the different AI efforts by all the different components. So I think when you look at that level of transparency, it should give should give the public some some confidence. As far as security, J Jay was touching on this, but obviously, you know, we're going very slowly and cautiously as we we look to implement, uh, you know, any of these models. And what that means for us is just making sure that every single security uh, guideline is going to be followed before we actually implement this on our data. Thanks. So the last topic, as we are almost at that that golden time. Um, and this is really to, to Amy, to Wole, and to Jay. This has to do with adversarial AI. So this is the question of whether it is model poisoning, data poisoning, um, deep fakes, um, what have you. What are your thoughts on the dangers, and how do we mitigate for those? And whoever wants to pick up on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. So the, the, when dealing with red AI, right, the challenge of someone uh, having an adverse effect to the data that you're trying to, to deal with, you, you first have to understand the data stream of that particular data. 
If you're dealing with a concise data stream where you have a camera collecting data that goes to an image that's evaluated by an AI, other than someone doing something silly in front of the camera like wearing a face mask so that you can't do facial recognition or they wear something over themselves to make them look like a camel as opposed to a person walking, right? And we've seen all of that. Um, that's not red AI, that's just trying to mess with the sensor. But if you start dealing with open source models or you're dealing with data from known good sources and you accidentally mess up your model, or you're collecting from open source models or data from uh, sources that you don't trust, you could rapidly skew your result uh, to the point where you get the wrong answer. There are defensive techniques that are in play. The, uh, the uh, memo from OMB uh, has some reference to this. There is some information available in the DOD community that they're dealing with this, and I think that that's already been shared right, uh, appropriately about how to deal with different types of data streams and how you defend against red AI from messing with you. Some of those, some of those include inserting what we call boundary controls, right? There's no way that this answer is valid and that answer, answer is out of bounds and therefore we have a real problem and you shut down. Um, one of the other solutions that we use in some of the customers that I'm supporting is we use what we call the NASA shuttle method, right, where quite literally you analyze a piece of data three times by three different state systems. And each system drops out a specific piece of data that might be weird. And if one of those computing systems says, I have a different answer than everybody else, everybody pauses. You'll notice that the shuttle never crashes, folks, but you wouldn't believe that you have a 30% error rate on the data on the shuttle when it lands. It's because one computer always has got a different issue and the other two agree. It's a voting thing, right? And so there's, there's some of that going on now in some of the AI research where um, we are using AI models uh, in the community right now to accomplish certain goals, and we need to have that fidelity. And we, and we have to then tag what is read and then discard it or quarantine it and figure out how it got there. So those are just some of those defensive techniques. But when we talk about the ethics of AI, there's what AI might do because we don't want it to do, yeah. and there's ethics, or there's what AI will do because the adversarial is aiming something at us. So I'll be brief. So, so this is an area that's super important. It's an area of ongoing work, ongoing research. From a, an AI model perspective, we do a significant amount of red teaming, uh, threat testing against the model to um, prevent jailbreaking attacks. Uh, when it comes to generative, generative AI generated uh, content, uh, specifically images and videos, we enable watermarking of that content to attest that this is AI generated. And then from a customer perspective, in addition to everything that we do, we provide controls that enable customers to calibrate and do content filtering so that they can adjust. Because there may be some situations where a customer may want uh, something that we think is inappropriate coming from the model as part of maybe investigation, testing, et cetera. And so we enable lo different levels of calibration on top of that. Yeah, and um, so we just did a big study actually this summer uh, in uh, adversarial AI, and uh, we started out by scoping it, right, and defining it. And a lot of people want to say adversarial AI is adversarial machine learning, which is AI on AI. Um, uh, and we took a broader scope, and we included things like uh, nefarious use of AI uh, on people, right? So, um, and what... Uh, we went through a number of use cases in, uh, you know, biometrics, C2ISR, all the missions, computer vision, uh, audio recognition, uh, NLP, uh, and really what we learned from that uh, at the end of the day, at a very high level, conceptual, uh, was that model evasion was of high concern early to us, uh, as was generative AI. And those two things together were especially powerful, people using generative AI to come up with ways to evade um, model-based processes. Um, so, so one of our uh, concerns that we're working uh, initially right now is really morphing uh, and the whole idea of uh, morphing GANs uh, in passports uh, you know, at the border. Uh, and, which is basically where you have uh, a picture that can match, uh, well, you have two different photos and you blend them together in such a way that the photo can match either person. Uh, so that's a very important use case for us that we're um, uh, working on with the DOE labs right now. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. One more question, guys, and we leave. Sean, final word. What do you need most from industry? Uh, 
and again, this is a, a theme that, that uh, we've heard before, uh, the willingness to collaborate with other vendors. Uh, I, I think you know, what we've realized in this space is that um, as, as great as individual companies have, have capacities, uh, I, I don't think anybody has all of the puzzle uh, together. So one thing we're always looking to do, we have a responsibility to, to build a, for, for the resources we're going to put towards something, to build toward the best value. Um, and what that means a lot of times is working, working with different vendors in a modular approach that we can get the, the best in breed or best in class uh, part of that solution. So we're always looking for vendors that are willing to work with other vendors uh, and to collaborate with them. So that certainly, certainly is, a, is a plus. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Megan, over to you. <laughs> I just want to give another round of applause to all of our speakers on today's program.